We're in for a treat this week. It's The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. It's a tale in seven stories, uh, so I may split this up. This is the first story, which has to do with a mirror and its fragments. Now then, we'll begin. When the story is done, you shall know a great deal more than you know now. He was a terribly bad hobgoblin, a goblin of the very wickedest sort, and, in fact, he was the devil himself. One day the devil was in a very good humour, because he had just finished a mirror that had this peculiar power. Everything good and beautiful that was reflected in it seemed to dwindle to almost nothing at all, while everything that was worthless and ugly became most conspicuous and even uglier than ever. In this mirror, the loveliest landscapes looked like boiled spinach, and the very best people became hideous or stood on their heads and had no stomachs. Their faces were distorted beyond any recognition, and if a person had a freckle, it was sure to spread until it covered both nose and mouth. That's very funny, said the devil. If a good, pious thought passed through anyone's mind, it showed in the mirror as a carnal grin, and the devil laughed aloud at his ingenious invention. All those who went to the hobgoblin school, for he had a school of his own, told everyone that a miracle had come to pass. Now, they asserted, for the very first time, you could see how the world and its people really looked. They scurried about with the mirror until there was not a person alive nor a land on earth that had not been distorted. Then they wanted to fly up to heaven itself, to scoff at the angels and our Lord. The higher they flew with the mirror, the wider it grinned. They could hardly manage to hold it. Higher they flew, and higher still, nearer to heaven and the angels. Then the grinning mirror trembled with such violence that it slipped from their hands and fell to the earth, where it shattered into hundreds of millions of billions of bits, or perhaps even more. And now it caused more trouble than it did before it was broken, because some of the fragments were smaller than a grain of sand, and these went flying throughout the wide world. Once they got in people's eyes, they would stay there. These bits of glass distorted everything the people saw, and made them see only the bad side of things. For every little bit of glass kept the same power that the whole mirror had possessed. A few people even got a glass splinter in their hearts, and that was a terrible thing, for it turned their hearts into lumps of ice. Some of the fragments were so large that they were used as window panes, but not the kind of window through which you should look at your friends. Other pieces were made into spectacles, and evil things came to pass when people put them on to see clearly and see justice done. The fiend was so tickled by it all that he laughed till his sides were sore but fine bits of the glass are still flying through the air, and now you shall hear what happened. This is the second story, A Little Boy and a Little Girl. In the big city, it was so crowded with houses and people that few found room for even a small garden, and most people had to be content with a flower pot. But two poor children who lived there managed to have a garden that was a little bigger than a flower pot. These children were not brother and sister, but they loved each other just as much as if they had been. Their parents lived close to one another in the garrets of two adjoining houses, where the roofs met and where the rain gutter ran between the two houses. Their two small windows faced each other. One had only to step across the rain gutter to go from window to window. In these windows, the parents had a large box in which they planted vegetables for their use, and a little rose bush too. Each box had a bush which thrived to perfection. Then it occurred to the parents to put these boxes across the gutter, where they very nearly reached from one window to the other, and looked exactly like two walls of flowers. The pea plants hung down over the boxes, and the rose bushes threw out long sprays that framed the windows and bent over toward each other. It was almost like a little triumphal arch of greenery and flowers. The boxes were very high, and the children knew that they were not to climb about on them. But they were often allowed to take their little stools out on the roof under the roses, where they had a wonderful time playing together. Winter, of course, put an end to this pleasure. The windows often frosted over completely, but they would heat copper pennies on the stove and press these hot coins against the frost-coated glass. Then they had the finest peepholes, as round as a ring, 
and behind them appeared a bright, friendly eye, one at each window. It was the little boy and the little girl who peeped out. His name was Kay, and hers was Gerda. With one skip, they could join each other in summertime. But to visit in the winter time, they had to go all the way downstairs in one house and climb all the way upstairs in the other. Outside, the snow was whirling. See the white bees swarming, the old grandmother said. Do they have a queen bee too? the little boy asked, for he knew that real bees have one. Yes, indeed they do, the grandmother said. She flies in the thick of the swarm. She's the biggest bee of all and can never stay quietly on the earth, but goes back again to the dark clouds. Many a wintry night she flies through the streets and peers in through the windows. Then they freeze over in a strange fashion, as if they were covered with flowers. Oh yes, we've seen that, both the children said, and so they knew it was true. Can the Snow Queen come in here? the little girl asked. Well, let her come, cried the boy. I'll put her on the hot stove and melt her. But Grandmother stroked his head and told them other stories. That evening, when little Kay was at home and half ready for bed, he climbed the chair by the window and looked out through the little peephole. A few snowflakes were falling, and the largest flake of all alighted on the edge of the flower boxes. This flake grew bigger and bigger, until at last it turned into a woman who was dressed in the finest white gauze that looked as if it had been made from millions of star-shaped flakes. She was beautiful, and she was graceful, but she was ice, shining, glittering ice. She was alive, for all that, and her eyes sparkled like two bright stars, but in them there was neither rest nor peace. She nodded toward the window and beckoned with her hand. The little boy was frightened. As he jumped down from the chair, it seemed to him that a huge bird flew past the window. The next day was clear and cold. Then the snow thawed and springtime came. The sun shone, the green grass sprouted, swallows made their nests, windows were thrown open, and once again the children played in their little roof garden, high up in the rain gutter, on top of the house. That summer the roses bloomed their splendid best. The little girl had learned a hymn in which there was a line about roses that reminded her of their own flowers. She sang it to the little boy, and he sang it with her. Where roses bloom so sweetly in the vale, there shall you find the Christ child without fail. The children held each other by the hand, kissed the roses, looked up at the Lord's clear sunshine, and spoke as if the Christ child were there. What glorious summer days those were, and how beautiful it was out under those fragment rose bushes that seemed as if they would never stop blooming. Kay and Gerda were looking at a picture book of birds and beasts one day, and it was then, just as the clock in the church tower was striking five, that Kay cried, Oh, something hurt my heart, and now I've got something in my eye. The little girl put her arm around his neck, and he blinked his eye. No. She couldn't see anything in it. I think it's gone, he said. But it was not gone. It was one of those splinters of glass from the magic mirror. You remember that goblin's mirror? The one that made everything great and good that was reflected in it appear small and ugly, but that magnified all evil things until each blemish loomed large. Poor Kay! A fragment had pierced his heart as well, and soon it would turn into a lump of ice. The pain had stopped but the glass was still there. Why should you be crying? he asked. It makes you look so ugly. There's nothing the matter with me. And suddenly he took it into his head to say, Ugh, oh, that rose is all worm-eaten, and look, this one's crooked. And these roses, they are just as ugly as they can be. They look like the boxes they grow in. He gave the boxes a kick and broke off both of the roses. Kay, what are you doing? the little girl cried. When he saw how it upset her, he broke off another rose, and then leapt home through his own window, leaving dear little Gerda all alone. Afterwards, when she brought out her picture book, he said it was fit only for babes in the cradle, and whenever Grandmother told stories, he always broke in with a, but, if he could manage it, he would steal behind her, perch a pair of spectacles on his nose and imitate her. He did this so cleverly that it made everybody laugh, and before long he could mimic the walk and the talk of everyone who lived on that street. Everything that was odd or ugly about them Kay could mimic so well that people said, 
That boy has surely got a good head on him. But it was the glass in his eye and the glass in his heart that made him tease even little Gerda, who loved him with all her soul. Now his games were very different from what they used to be. They became more sensible. When the snow was flying about one wintry day, he brought a large magnifying glass out of doors and spread the tail of his blue coat to let the snowflakes fall on it. Now look through the glass, he told Gerda. Each snowflake seemed much larger and looked like a magnificent flower on a ten-pointed star. It was marvellous to look at. Look, how artistic, said Kay. They are much more interesting to look at than real flowers, for they are absolutely perfect. There isn't a flaw in them until they start melting. A little while later, Kay came down with his big gloves on his hands and his sled on his back. Right in Gerda's ear, he bawled out, I've been given permission to play in the big square where the other boys are. And away he ran. In the square, some of the more adventurous boys would tie their little sleds on behind the farmer's carts to be pulled along for quite a distance. It was wonderful sport. While the fun was at its height, a big sleigh drove up. It was painted entirely white, and the driver wore a white shaggy fur coat and a white shaggy cap. As the sleigh drove twice around the square, Kay quickly hooked his little sled behind it, and down the street they went, faster and faster. The driver turned around in a friendly fashion and nodded to Kay, just as if they were old acquaintances. Every time Kay started to unfasten his little sleigh, its driver nodded again, and Kay held on, even when they drove right out through the town gate. Then the snow began to fall so fast that the boy could not see his hands in front of him as they sped on. He suddenly let go the slack of the rope in his hands in order to get loose from the big sleigh, but it did no good. His little sled was tied on securely, and they went like the wind. He gave a loud shout, but nobody heard him. The snow whirled, and the sleigh flew along. Every now and then it gave a jump, as if it were clearing hedges and ditches. The boy was terror-stricken. He tried to say his prayers, but all he could remember was his multiplication tables. The snowflakes got bigger and bigger, until they looked like big white hens. All of a sudden, the curtain of snow parted, and the big sleigh stopped, and the driver stood up. The fur coat and the cap were made of snow, and it was a woman, tall and slender, and blinding white. She was the Snow Queen herself. "'We've made good time,' she said. "'It is possible that you tremble from cold? Crawl under my bare coat.' She took him up in the sleigh beside her, and as she wrapped the fur about him, he felt as if he were sinking into a snowdrift. Are you still cold? she asked, and kissed him on the forehead. Oh, that kiss was colder than ice. He felt it right down to his heart, half of which was already an icy lump. He felt as if he were dying, but only for a moment. Then he felt quite comfortable, and no longer noticed the cold. My sled! Don't forget my sled! It was the only thing he thought of. They tied it to one of the white hens, which flew along after them with the sled on its back. The Snow Queen kissed Kay once more, and then he forgot little Gerda, and Grandmother, and all the others at home. You won't get any more kisses now, she said, or else I should kiss you to death. Kay looked at her. She was so beautiful. A cleverer and prettier face he could not imagine. She no longer seemed to be made of ice, as she had seemed when she sat outside his window and beckoned to him. In his eyes, she was perfect, and she was not at all afraid. He told her how he could do mental arithmetic, even with fractions, and that he knew the size and population of all the countries. She kept on smiling, and he began to be afraid that he did not know as much as he thought he did. He looked up at the great big space overhead as she flew with him, high up on the black clouds, while the storm whistled and roared as if it were singing old ballads. They flew over forests and lakes, over many a land and sea, Below them, the wind blew cold, wolves howled, and black crows screamed as they skimmed across the glittering snow. But up above, the moon shone bright and large, and on it, Kay fixed his eyes throughout the long, long winter night. By day, he slept at the feet of the Snow Queen. That was part one, and technically also part two, but the first part was so short that I've thrown it in for free. Um, this is the Snow Queen, 
uh, there'll be more of this very soon. Um, so join me tomorrow or next week. You'll have to subscribe to find out when uh, for the next part of the story. We'll find out what happens with Gerda, what happens with Kay, what happens with the Snow Queen. Um, yeah, there's links in the description to various things if you want to follow me around the net. Um, thanks for watching. Bye.